Hello class, today I will be discussing how you can practice sexual wellness. My name is Sierra Elston and I'm the coordinator of wellness education for the William McGee Center for AOD and wellness education. And before we get started discussing safe sexual health practices, I am going to go over a brief introduction of what work we do and how we define wellness. The William McGee Center cares deeply about our students, their well-being during their collegiate experience, and setting them up for a lifetime of wellness. We care, and that's why our core mission at the William McGee Center is changing and improving lives through education, research, and support related to alcohol and other drugs and holistic well-being. So what is wellness? According to the World Health Organization, wellness is defined as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. The William McGee Center recognizes 10 different dimensions of wellness you see with their corresponding WE, or Wellness Education, brand logo. These include physical, mental, sexual, financial, cultural, social, intellectual, spiritual, environmental, and occupational wellness. Today we will be discussing sexual wellness, which by definition is a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, as well as the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences. Starting off, it is important to point out that the only guaranteed way to prevent STIs or unplanned pregnancy is to refrain from sexual activity. However, statistics show us that most people end up having sex in their lifetime, more commonly with multiple partners. We want to provide you with all the information you need to make informed decisions about your body and your health. As many college students fall in the age group of 18 to 24 years old, this puts them at the highest statistical risk for contracting an STI or unplanned pregnancy. In fact, nearly half of the 20 million new sexually transmitted infections diagnosed each year are among young people aged 15 to 24 years and women aged 18 to 24 at the highest risk for unplanned pregnancy. These statistics might seem scary, but by the end of this presentation, you will have the skills and knowledge to make safe choices. Another critical component of sexual wellness is communication and consent. Regardless of if you choose to be sexually active or not, it is important to have a good understanding of what consent is and how to effectively communicate your boundaries. So now that you have an understanding as to why sexual wellness is relevant to you, we are going to dive deeper. To begin, it is important that we reach a common ground with the language that we will be using during the presentation. So first, what is sex? And we define that as the act carried out for procreation or for pleasure. What are the three types of sex? And that would be oral, anal, and vaginal. Then what is not sex? And we would define that as anything not sex being kissing, cuddling, snuggling, or hugging. And finally, what is abstinence? And we define that as the act or practice of refraining from some action, specifically sex in this case. Um, and it's important to know that abstinence does prevent pregnancy and the risk of STI contraction. And um, it's also important to remember never to let anyone make you feel bad about your decision to be abstinent. I do want to encourage you to visit our website at mcgee.oldmiss.edu for more information about the basics of sexual wellness or if you would like more information regarding any of our dimensions of wellness. So now that we have some examples, let's discuss how slang impacts your communication with your sexual partners. Slang isn't understood by everyone the same way and because of this, understanding and clear communication are essential components of consent. Take, for example, the phrase Netflix and chill. There are, dozen, uh, there are dozens of words and phrases similar to this phrase that might make these conversations confusing with your sex partners. Communicating with a partner about sex should be clear and direct and leave no room for interpretation. Clear communication is an essential component of giving and receiving consent. As we said before, consent should be clear and mutually understood, leaving no room for interpretation. It should be freely given and shouldn't be forced, pressured, or coerced. It should be informed and aware of what is happening, the consequences and benefits of that action. And then finally, consent should be changeable, meaning that at any point or moment, consent can be taken away. You should not proceed with an activity if consent has changed. So now that we've discussed what conversations to have prior to engaging in sexual activity or intercourse, We'll now take a second to talk about how to be safe during sex and why it's important to practice safe sex. STIs, also known as sexually transmitted infections, are prominent across college campuses. 
it is important to know how you can contract an STI and then how to reduce your risk for contracting one and the symptoms of each STI. Bacterial STIs can be contracted from unprotected vaginal, anal, or oral sex. Gonorrhea and syphilis can be transmitted from mother to the unborn child. Syphilis can be contracted by direct touch, kissing, and close body contact as well. These bacterial STIs can often be cured with antibiotics after the STI has been confirmed by your health care provider. Viral STIs are also contracted from unprotected vaginal, anal, and oral sex. HIV can be contracted from sharing needles and mother to the unborn child as well. HPV, also known as genital warts, can be contracted from direct skin-to-skin -skin contact as well. Viral STIs have no cure, but symptoms are often able to be treated with med medication. So knowing that there are so many STIs around and that condoms are the safest way to engage in safe sex, it's important to understand how to communicate with your partner to make sure you're both taking steps to have safe sex. We'll take a moment to review how you can start conversations about using all condoms with your partner and then review the right steps to take when using a male or female condom. This video is about condom negotiation strategies. However, before we discuss any condom negotiation strategies, let's talk about consent. Part of consenting to a sexual activity means that you feel safe. And feeling safe may come from preventing sexually transmitted infections and pregnancy. Condoms are one way to prevent from both sexually transmitted infections and pregnancy. So here are some condom negotiation strategies that you can use. Scenario one, try something different. I'm at the grocery store. Should I pick up condoms for tonight? Ooh, I see some. I can't feel anything with the condoms. Oh, well, why don't we try a different brand? Maybe you'll like some of these ultra thin ones. Scenario two, past performance does not determine future performance. Oh, it looks like I need to run out and get some condoms to run out. We already did it without a condoms. Yeah, and that made me realize that I really don't feel safe or like to do it without a condom on. Scenario three, contraception misconceptions. So, do you have a condom? Are you on the pill? Yeah, cool. We don't have to worry about pregnancy, but we still have to worry about sexually transmitted infections. Scenario four. Seriously, bro? Well, man, we need to be there at four, and we need to grab some condoms first. I was born time. Don't worry. Yeah, right. If we're not going to use condoms, we're not going to have sex. Scenario five. No glove, no love. Hey, um, are you at uni? Do you mind picking up some condoms on your way home? I was thinking of coming over today. Uh, I thought you were here yesterday. Why do I have to pick up condoms? Um, because it's not safe. I can still get pregnant or an STI. All right, so now let's take a look at the steps used when properly using a male condom. This is a condom demonstration. People use condoms to lower the risk of STIs and pregnancy. It is important to put a condom on before you have any sexual contact. This type of condom can be used for any type of sex with a penis. There are lots of different condoms to choose from. If someone is allergic to latex, they can use a latex-free condom. Any condom that says it protects against pregnancy, STIs, and HIV is made out of a material that works. Before using a condom, there are two things to check. The first is the expiry date. Condoms break down over time. Check the expiry date printed on the condom package or on the box. This one has not expired yet, so it would be good to use today. The second thing to check is that the package does not have any holes and that it looks like it's in good condition. To do this, squeeze the package and make sure you feel for a pocket of air, like a bag of chips. That shows there are no holes in the package. Now is a good time for a reminder. Condoms need careful storage. They are sensitive to heat, cold, folding, sunlight, and rubbing. I am now ready to open the condom package. 
to open a condom, push the condom over to one side and then rip down the other side of the package. Be careful, fingernails and jewelry can damage condoms. Never use teeth or scissors to open a condom package. Condoms sometimes come with lubricant already on them and you can add more water-based or silicone-based lubricant if you want. Anything with oil in it will break a condom, such as body lotion. When you look at a condom, you can see that the tip can be pushed through either way, but there is a right way and a wrong way to put on a condom. When you look carefully at a rolled up condom, you can see a crease where the condom is rolled up on itself. If the condom is on the penis correctly, you will see the crease folding in and around the tip. An easy way to remember which way the condom should go on the penis is that it looks something like a sombrero. I'm going to use my fingers to simulate a penis. As I place the condom on the end of the erect penis, I'm going to pinch the tip. The tip of the condom gives space for semen, or some people call it cum. It's important that there is space at the tip of the condom, otherwise the condom could break. Squeezing air out of the tip is what makes room for the ejaculated semen. I keep it pinched and roll the condom down. With a real penis, I would use two hands to pinch and roll, all the way down to the base of the penis. Now the condom is on the penis correctly and you are ready for sexual activity. After ejaculation, while the penis is still hard, hold on to the base of the condom and pull out from the body. Then carefully remove the condom and tie it in a knot. Throw the condom in the garbage, not in the toilet, because it can clog your toilet or wreck your septic system. Use condoms one at a time and use a new condom each time you have sex or switch sexual activities, like going from anal sex to vaginal sex. Practicing safer sex is all about protection, consent, and communication. For information and services about sexual and reproductive health in your area, visit ahs.ca slash srh, call 811 for health link, or talk to your healthcare provider. All right, and then now let's look at the right steps to take when using a female condom. Internal condoms, also known as female condoms, go inside your vagina or anus and are used during sex. Like other condoms, they help prevent STDs in pregnancy. Internal condoms are easy to use. For vaginal sex, squeeze the sides of the inner ring at the closed end of the condom and slide it deep into your vagina. For anal sex, remove the inner ring and insert the condom into your anus with your finger. Leave the open end of the condom outside of your body. During sex, make sure the penis or sex toy goes into the condom and doesn't slip outside of the condom or push the open end of the condom all the way inside you. Internal condoms are one-time use only, so use a new one every time you have sex. Internal condoms work great with other birth control methods, like the pill or IUD, for extra pregnancy preventing power. And unlike other types of birth control, internal condoms also help protect you from STDs. Internal condoms can be harder to get than traditional condoms. You can get them online, at many Planned Parenthood health centers, other family planning and health clinics, and in drugstores with a prescription from your nurse or doctor. Want to learn more about internal condoms? Check out PlannedParenthood.org. All right, and it is important to note that you can pick up male or female condoms at no cost by visiting our office suite or at the University Health Center. So on this slide, we've listed some of the many pregnancy prevention options available for contraception. A pregnancy prevention should always begin with having a clear conversation with your partner about contraception expectations. To some, this may seem like a no-brainer, but it's not always the woman's responsibility to take the pill and the man's responsibility to bring a condom. The responsibility, conversation, and negotiation belong to anyone wishing to have sex. Make sure you speak with your doctor about your options and know that certain birth control options may potentially increase your chances of pregnancy, especially if not used properly. If you are seeking access to birth control, you should initiate these conversations by asking the right questions to your health care provider. Research your options and begin asking your health care provider the pros, cons, and safety of birth control options that you are considering. Remember that you, only you have control over deciding what contraception options are best for your body. After all this information, you still may have some questions that have not been answered. And for a deeper discussion on any of these topics, you should talk with a physician or nurse practitioner at the Student Health Center, 
the Lafayette County Health Department or with Planned Parenthood. So given the risk of contracting STIs and the fact that many can go undetected for weeks or months at a time, it's important to know your status. Make sure you do get tested if you're sexually active. If you have multiple partners, you may want to get tested every three to six months. If you have one partner, getting checked every six months to one year will be important. Tests may require urine, blood, pap smear, a pelvic examination, a physical examination, or uh, any combination of these tests. An important note is that the University Health Center on our Ole Miss campus values your confidentiality. And if you do get tested there and choose to put the cost on your bursar, it will show up as a general health check instead of language indicating an STI check. Please contact any of these resources with questions about testing. The William McGee Center has some exciting things happening year round. And if you're looking for an on-campus job, interested in booking a wellness consultation, or just looking to get more information, make sure you follow us on our social media to keep up. I do wanna thank you all for listening and participating in today's lessons. And I hope you learned something that you can use and share with your friends. If you have any more questions about anything related to sexual health, please contact us at wellnessedu at olmiss.edu or stop by our office suite located within the South Campus Recreation Center about a mile from campus.